you late April, everyone. So online problem solving forum continues to be great, at least from my perspective, because we, I get to interact with lots and lots of people who have schedules that are all over the map. And they can't make it office hours, or oh, I have a question at 3 in the morning, write it here, <laughs> write it here. Um, if you dig through this, if you haven't used this yet, um, often it's a back and forth. It isn't just a, you ask a question, here's the answer. It's often like, well, here's the next step. Tell me where you get stuck next. Or here's what I think answers your question. But if that doesn't make sense, post a follow-up question. And people do. So a lot of it's back and forth. It's a good, for a thing that's literally just a Google Doc, it's actually a pretty good conversation. So it's good. I like this. Thing. We're on pace. I used to do it a different way, and no one used it. And now I feel like I figured it out a little bit, because people be using it. So that's good. Syllabus. Let's see here. Where are we? Today is April 18th, so we will do chapter 20, which is organic chemistry. No, it didn't get canceled. No, 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 you don't want organic to be canceled. This is the section people tend to do the best at. So if you like points, you want to do this chapter. If you don't like points, then you're right there. Yeah. Um, no, this is both really useful to all of our science majors, and frankly to everybody, because now you will look at a nutrition label and go, I'm not even that, because you know what it is. Um, so it's useful even to like, even if you don't go into science. Um, but it's also it tends to be the section people grab onto, and like, they get in it for some reason. So I hope they're able to do that. This is people tend to have a lot of fun with it. I am not completely convinced that we're going to get through that in time to do the metal and coordination chemistry. We may kind of bump that one off the exam three and we'll spend the next couple of times going through organic. So don't be surprised if that happens. Because I would rather spend more time organic and do it well. <coughs> um, so we'll see if that's going to be blessing. But, a couple of points. We are, there might be one more. Legit quiz. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I put this twice there. At any rate, the next two quizzes are flashcards. Which means you can do them and if you want, you can check them with me or another instructor beforehand so you can make sure you have it under. And then what we'll do is I'll set up the, one of the tables up here and me and the ISAs or whoever I can coerce into doing this with me has the like attendance and has all of your names and you come up and show me that they're complete. We go, yeah, all right, we check you out. That's good. Quiz scores should go up. Um, in these PowerPoint is the description of what they are. And one of them is this Thursday. So pretty quick turnaround, but still get it done. It's only 25 and 30 cards, not so bad. Um, and the other one is at the exam. No, you're not allowed to use them on the exam, so there's the temptation that's out there. But that's um, and when you hand in your exam, you'll do the same thing. You'll show us and we'll check off on the exam so it's even easier as we do the But essentially, three points for you getting your own study paid together. So that's good for everybody. Let's see electric chemistry, organic chemistry, and the building blocks of bio and biochemistry. That's exam three. That's next Thursday. Woo oh. Is it not? Someone just reminded me of that today. I didn't remember that either. All right, well, let's do it then, huh? Let's see. Okay, this is organic. I don't know if I'm going down there. I want to look at... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I want to look at electrochem. So these should be all posted along with the videos of what we talked about in class. Oh yeah, there's one. Um, you will notice we didn't get to all of these slides. We're, yeah, they, they won't be on the exam then. 
There's some more, but we don't, don't worry about that. What else do we have? Um, corrosion. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it, but we won't put it on the exam. Um, there's some more practice that if you want to try these and then come with me, I can show you if you don't write. So, like, extra practice if you want it. But that's all. Um, so, takeaway is the portion of these slides that we did, that's the portion that we're going to cover. <coughs> Um, I forgot to make a point about exam two. One thing that we did not do, being me and the graders with exam two, that I meant to do is on your exam, put how many points each one was out of. So I got 14. Well, okay, did I get it right or not? It fell through the cracks, and we intend to do that so that you know. The mechanical way to do it is now in this folder, exam two, where you found the practice exams, I posted the key to this semester's exam. So that's got the answers, but also the points. Um, so there's that for that, but you can go through each one and say, okay, that was worth three, that was worth four, da 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 da, -da. and you can figure it out from there. So a little bit of extra work because we goofed on that, but at least it's accessible and I'm happy to help you with it as needed. Okay. Any procedural questions or thoughts? Other than spring break two? Spring break two max. Okay, let's do organic chemistry. For this one, I was good and wrote the learning outcomes. By the time of exam three next Thursday, students will be able to do the following. Identify and name functional groups in organic molecules. I think I know what organic molecules, but I don't know what functional group is. That's okay, we can do it. Write a chemical formula based on a drawing. I think this is maybe the most important skill in this whole section. When you get to organic chem or biochem and you see the amino acid, to be able to say, well, what, what are the, all the atoms in there? Name alkanes. Octane. Methane. Things like that. Some of propane. Some of them are familiar from like normal life, but we'll do that. Identify orbital hybridization and geometry based on a chemical drawing. Dig into a little bit of like starting to look towards Vesper and that sort of material from one side, but not getting quite as detailed as that because it's just carbon. And relative polarity, relative hydrophilicity. So it's like, does this material like water? Here's the flashcards. I don't want to go through every word on the slide because it's there, and you will then refer to this and say, yes, I am done now because I have done these things. Um, what these all are will make more sense as we go through it. And let me, let me know what you think. Chris is due Thursday. You want to have it due Tuesday instead? You want more time for flashcards? The only reason not to do that is that it's useful for you to have the study aid for the test sooner. So here's what we'll do. We'll make the flashcards due on Tuesday, so that'll be when we'll actually check out for the points. I would suggest starting them as we go. So don't do them all on Tuesday at 3.45 p.m. before this class. Um, you know, if we get to the functional groups today, go and do those tonight or tomorrow. Is what I would recommend. Because the sooner you get it, the sooner you start practicing, the better off you'll be. But let's do that. Let's make this do Tuesday. And that is the 25th. And I think I mentioned last time, I'm completely agnostic of format. Like when I did it, it was slash hard to start back, so we could do one page. Uh, that works for you, that's good, so we can do an app, because they like to swipe. They don't like to flip. Fine. Whatever works for you is good. Cool. Yep, any format you want, as long as you have the concept, it's fine with me, whatever you study best for. Here's the second quiz. Again, as we get through this material, you can hack through these in the book or Wikipedia or what have you at any time, but the, the meaning of these will become more clear as we discuss them. Amino acids, four classes of biomolecules. I remember very clearly in my biochem class when the professor, there he is, team talk, so one of them, one of the professors said, here's, what, here's the normal path, here's the typical path to becoming a professor at a university. And I was kind of shocked that no one had ever told me that before. So I figured we'll do it here. Um, I do this because this is typical. I, it's worth noting this is not exactly what I did. So this is not by any means the only way to get there. Um, but 
if you have a career that you're interested in doing and you say, you know what, that's something I think I want to do, and no one has ever told me what the path is, I hope you find someone who can tell you what the path is. Good answer. Okay, so in general, though, if you, if you say, like, oh, I'll be a physician's assistant, but you don't know anyone that can tell you exactly how to do that, let me know. I will find someone who can tell you. If you say, I want to be a researcher in marine biology, I will find someone. Whatever it is, let me know. We'll find someone who can help you find it. Right so, undergraduate used to take four years. More and more people are taking five years, six years. It's normal now. Four years is good. We'll get you there if we can, but it's very, very common. So don't sweat if it takes more than four. Typically, you major in the subject of interest. I'm a chemistry professor, I'm majoring in chemistry. It's not always true. Sometimes you'll be a chemist and then you go to biology. I had one advisor who was a professor of chemistry who majored in art as an undergrad, and he really liked lithography. He really liked stuff where the acids etch metals and patterns, and got into the chemistry of that, and then said, wow, I'll just do the chemistry part. It's a good job. Anyway, um, you can transition from field to field. Yeah, all right. That's good. Um, if, if at all possible, do research. It's preferable if it's in the stuff you're interested in, but research, all research is good experience. It's still good. I, uh, best advice I got at the graduation was take the GRE now, because I was planning to take two years off before going to grad school, and one of my advisors said, you are going to forget all this stuff, and if you go back and take the GRE after two years of doing something completely different, you're going to regret it. And she right. Take the exams, whatever exams you know you're going to need, take them while it's fresh. You'll do better. Uh, after an undergraduate, sometimes people take time off to work in industry or do other things, many of us do. Uh, then you do a PhD. This is typically four to seven years, depends highly on the discipline. Engineering tends to be shorter, ecology tends to be longer, it varies. chemistry tends to be five, five and a half. I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm going to a PhD program. And she laughed. I said, Well, thanks for the support, Mom. That's nice. And she said, How are you going to pay for that? I was like, Thanks. Okay, uh, they pay you. She was like, what? So in most PhD programs, because you're doing research, because you're a teaching assistant for some of it, they pay you. And it's not a ton of, ton of money, but it's enough to live on the health insurance, which is good. Um, summers are typically all research. That's me trying to like push ahead and get a lot of stuff done. There are competitive fellowships from National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, things like that. These are really good. You typically get a 30% boost in pay. It's easier to get a position where you want, and you teach less. Soon. This is all good. The part that I laughed at when my bad chemistry professor told me this was he said, then after your PhD, you do what's called a postdoc. And you go do it again. And I was like, no way. You gotta be kidding me. You just did like six years of a PhD and you don't need more. Let me tell you, almost everything I have said, I will never do that. Almost every single thing that's happened. So I did a postdoc. It was short, it was only about six months, but I did, um, so my PhD was on really fundamental science. It was, what do orbitals look like? How do electrons get into them? That sort of thing. And I wanted to do more applied work, so I found a postdoc doing CO2, turning CO2 into fuels. So I could get a little bit more hands-on, a little bit more applied electrochemistry, and that was good for me. I wanted that uh, Postdoc typically pays a little more. It's basically like a practice professor, because you do a lot of hands-on research, but you also do some mentoring, and you start writing. Uh, then you start applying for jobs after that, typically. But again, there are many paths, and it depends on the discipline. Huh? Then what? Then what what? Then this. Um, so I came here from industry, and it used to be that that didn't happen. That's gotten more and more and more common, because people go back and forth between academia and industry. And it's not a bad thing to do, because you come in with a skill set and a practice and contacts that might not otherwise have from both. Questions, thoughts? Right. Let's draw. CH4. Uh, how many electrons in a bond? Two in a single bond. carbon chain has the formula C5H12. Uh, 
uh, you'll see later that these chains tend to be a zigzag. There's five, but man, now I gotta, uh, I gotta do all these dots for the H's. The derisive giggling starts. But I got it. I got five carbons. They're bonded to each other. Single bond, single bond, single bond, single bond. I got a single bond to a bunch of hydrogen. Six carbon rings. So make a hexagon out of carbons. One proton on each carbon. So I'm going to do that same routine. I uh, two electrons and then a proton, an H on each one. And then, that's not really all that descriptive, but alternating double and single bonds. That's what I should have said. So between these carbons, I'll put a single, and then in the next one, I'll put a double bond, which means I need two pairs. And then a single, and then a double. Single, double. And now I have the formula C6H6. This molecule is called benzene. I think you can still buy at Home Depot. Maybe, maybe not. It's pretty bad for you, so I don't know if they still sell it. Say again? Uh, the question is, what is it used for? Benzene is a, I mean, it's a solvent. It's kind of a throwaway answer. Um, things like thinning paint, dissolving grease off of engine parts, things like that. But it's, uh, it's really pretty strongly carcinogenic, so it's been phased, mostly phased out for things that are still carcinogenic, but less so. Okay. That gets old. This is caffeine. Can you imagine doing that for caffeine? Boy, I would, I don't know. I guess I would do it, but I would be kind of angry about it. The convention that's used involves using lines for bonds. So a single line is a two electron bond. A double line, like you see here at the top, is a double bond. And that's two two-electron bonds, but we just did with two more pairs. Let's do that, those same three molecules, except let's do it with this convention where a line is a bond, and then we'll go through the, <coughs> the rules that apply here. Actually, let's go through, well, yeah, let's do that. Methane. I mean, it's kind of like a dot, really, but you can't do that, so let's do H's. You can draw the C in the middle, or not. Both are okay. But what about the C5 now? I need five carbons. When you put your pen on the paper, that's one. That's the trick to these. One, two, three, four, five. I really strongly recommend, if you're drawing a chain where you know the length, draw it and then go back and count, because it's real easy to accidentally draw an extra carbon. One, two, three, four, five. A point, an end of a line is a carbon. And an intersection of two lines is a carbon. Carbon is the only element that you're allowed to not show. You see in that molecule, you gotta have N, you gotta have O. But you can abbreviate a carbon as a point. You will also notice in that uh, in that drawing, some H's are written. CH3, CH3, CH3. Well, how many bonds does carbon make? 
four. Very good. Let's look at this carbon that's at sort of the point here, this one. As drawn, how many bonds is that carbon making? I got a single bond up, and I got a double bond diagonal down. So far, only three. That's not right. It should make four. Yeah, there's a hydrogen that's not shown. The convention allows you to not show all the hydrogens. Otherwise, you can have hydrogens all over the place and all it becomes hard. That's why for this five carbon chain, I don't have to draw the pages. They are what's called implicit, which means that it is put upon the reader to know if the carbon makes four bonds and know how many hydrogens must be there. So if the carbon's at the end, how many protons should I draw? This carbon is only making one bond so far, so I'll draw it to three protons. What about one of these vertices, an intersection? Yeah, you add two, that's right. Okay, good. Now let's do benzene. Make my hexagon. I want alternating double and single bonds. And because the hydrogens can be implicit, I don't have to draw them. You can. You can draw an H off each of those, but you don't have to. Lines? Yeah. yeah, so the question was what are the lines inside? These are the double bonds. And you can draw inside, you can draw outside, either one's fine, but you need to have uh, communicate to the reader in some form that there is a double bond between these two points, between these two cards. So you can, as a, you can draw inside, you can draw this many different sort of like, you can inch it in or out. Um, but it's one line, two lines. Which, um, the, the CH4? Yeah. So the, another way you might draw this is to put the C and draw the bonds to the hydrogen. What I would say in the middle is the, an intersection of lines, and an intersection of lines is a carbon unless there's another element that's written there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. Yeah, method. It's actually a tetrahedron, though. It's not an X. They go two go out. So this is going to go. We'll do it. I'll do it there. I'll do it there. I'll do it there. I'll do it there. Be, stay with me. I'll do it there. Now, now I got your interest, though. All right. Here's where we go through that explicitly. Hydrogen and carbon are not always drawn, but carbon always makes four bonds, unless you have a lone pair or a charge. This will happen in organic chemistry, where you get a carbon that's charged. I don't think we'll do it in here. And I don't think we'll do the carbon with the here. They happen, but they're less common. How many protons should be bound to these carbons? Or I guess are bound, because sometimes they're drawn in. How about this top one, this, this CH3 in the corner? Yeah, three. It's not that, that one I got. We already did this middle one. So it's already making one bond up, two bonds down. Needs one more. What about this intersection here at the bottom? It's got bond to the left, bond to the right, double bond up. Zero. Correct, zero. It, that carbon at the, the underbelly of caffeine is already making four bonds. I don't need to add any hydrogens to make it have four bonds. Yeah, Jeff. Um,
Molecules are often not drawn to scale. Here's ethanol, and here's caffeine. In, in, I guess I would say in real life, in a flask, which of these molecules takes up more space? Caffeine, because, how did you know? More bonds, more, bonds, more atoms, more molecules. You can scale them however you need. Sometimes you'll draw a protein. It's like a little plant protein. And then caffeine comes and interacts with protein. You can draw them the same size. Proteins are bigger than caffeine. Sometimes you do it just for the same space. So you should be aware they don't always scale directly. And do the analysis that some people report. That's great. More atoms means probably bigger. More atoms, more bonds, more bigger. Okay, that was, you know, all right, I was trying to prove a point. I made ethanol real big. These are two different amino acids. One is called leucine, and one is called vein. Which one of these takes up more space? We've seen the same reason. Yeah, it's slightly bigger. It has an extra atom in the chain, in what's called the side chain. So this part at the bottom, this backbone is the same. And double mongo, single mongo, that's the same for both. What's different, even the H is the same. What's different is this one tail that comes off. Whichever one has more atoms, well, but now that one's bigger. It's a little more nuanced than that, but frankly, that's the you probably need. These molecules actually live in three dimensions. We draw them, we used to draw them on paper, then we drew them on the chalkboard, then we drew them on the whiteboard, now we draw them on a tablet. But all of these things are two dimensional. And a convention was needed to show people what these the community, what a molecule looks like in three dimensions. If you go to organic, you'll get um, a molecular building kit where you'll build them, that's kind of fun. Um, maybe we could get one for us, but. The way it is drawn, the dashed line means the bond is going back into the border, into the paper. Whereas the wedge, this wedge, means it's coming out. The tetrahedron to the side, but in the plane, in the plane of the border. And then, So that you have two in the plane, and then two in, one in and one out of the board. And that's a tetrahedral curve. But the flat lines, like a regular line, either means it's in the plane that I'm drawing it, or it can also mean I don't know whether it's forward or back. Whereas a dash means I know it's going back, and a wedge means I know it's going forward. Write the chemical formula. I think, uh, let's do valine together and eight trilucine. My strategy is to collect all the elements that I will need and make a formula without numbers and then go find the numbers I need. So for valine, I have carbon, I have hydrogen, I have oxygen, and I have nitrogen. I will inevitably get the question, does the order of the letters matter? No. This is the order, one of the orders you will commonly see in it, but it doesn't matter. It's still right if you do it differently, so don't worry about that. 
Let's do the carbons. Actually, let's do the, the ones that I know I can do first. How many O's in there? Yep. And how many nitrogens? Just one. So you can write the one or you can leave it. Now let's do carbon. Remember, each intersection, get a different color. each intersection of lines that doesn't have a letter is a carbon. And each endpoint, an end of a line, a terminus that doesn't have a letter, that's a carbon. So if it's either an intersection of lines or if it's a line with no letter out there on the end, that's a carbon. Many people will number it on the paper. I got one, I got two, I got three, I got four, and I got five. So this is a C5 molecule. Oops. C5. H's. Some people like to do it in their head. Some people like to draw them all in. Both are fine, as long as it works for you. So I go through each of those carbons I just drew and tack on any hydrogens I need to have it to make it have four bonds. This carbon, I already got four. This carbon, it's got one hydrogen drawn in, but it's already got four bonds, so I don't need to add any. Now, carbon that I've labeled three, how many bonds does that make it so far? Three. So I'll add one proton, one hydrogen. Carbon I labeled four, that's an end. That's only making one bond so far, so I'll add three, right? And the same with this one. Then if you like, you can number them, or you can add them up as is. Different color. So green. One, two, three, four, bless you. Five, six, seven, eight, and then nine, ten, eleven. So I get eleven protons. You can see once you've tacked all this stuff on there, why the system is set up so you don't have to draw all the hydrogens, and why you don't have to draw all the letters. It gets to be a mess. And some people like to redraw the molecule like to the side so they have a clean one to work on and number it that way. We have lots of strategies that work. Try leucine. Please. Yes. Fair. So the carbon just assume that um, we need to put the hydrogen in to fill the bond like the bond type of That's right. So the question was, do we do does the reason we add the hydrogens to all the carbons so that we have a full octet? Yeah. Four bonds means eight electrons, and that carbon is happy. So I can try try new scenes, see what you get.
What'd you get? C6, H13, O2, N. Yep. So you can do it by the same method. Um, a couple of points. The carbon, well, this, inter this is an intersection. So this is a carbon. Because it's an intersection of two lines. They're pretty close. It's kind of visually different than we've seen so far. But that is an intersection, which means it's a carbon. And it means that it has as many hydrogens as it needs to get the full octet, to get the four bonds. Um, I got another really good question that comes up every time. There is a line that has an end. Since what is at the end, since you have a letter at the end, you're told that it's an oxygen, you do not add an extra carbon there. Carbon is only where a line terminates and there's nothing there, or where there's an intersection between lines. Mm -hmm. So the question was, can we do the H's? Yep. This carbon is already making four bonds. One H is drawn in. This is an intersection, and it, that carbon is only making two bonds so far. So I'll add some H's. Bless you. This carbon right here is making one, two, three bonds. I only need to add one. And these, uh, I'll do it this way because it's easier to draw, but you need three carbons at each of these. So you can write CH3 if that's more comfortable for you than drawing the three, or you can draw the three. Both are fine. And now let's count. Question? So this carbon is so far as drawn, only making two bonds. It has a line up and a line down. Every carbon needs to be making four bonds, so I know once I see the two, then I know I need two more. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Was your question about the count or about the where to draw? Some of both. Okay. 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 Good. What we've actually already seen a bunch of in these molecules. It's called functional groups. Why are they called functional groups? Because they have functions. That sounds kind of silly, but when you gasoline does not have a lot of functional groups, so it does not have a whole lot of biological activity. When your molecule starts to look more interesting, it starts to look like caffeine, that structure we saw, then it starts to interact with biology. It starts to do behavior, it starts to have chemistry. This is a table of functional groups from the book. There, I think, are at least two big misses in this table. And one of them, I think, is pretty important. The other one, I'm absolutely shocked that they didn't put it in here because it is the bond that holds together all proteins ever. It's kind of important to the work that we do. So there's a uh, flash card. That slide at the beginning that told you what flash charts you need to make for the functional groups has the list of each one. This is many of them. There's a few more that you'll need to look up. We can be just fine. You can look at Google we'll search and find and look at a camp textbook. You need memorize these. I, uh, I can't remember if I just told some people or if I told everyone before. Exam three for the electrochemistry, I'm going to give you that slide that has the half reaction balancing steps. Because I think that is something that where I really want to test the application. I want to say, like, in the future, I'm okay with you getting file cap and looking this up, but I need you to be able to apply it. So we'll do it that way. This, I'm not going to give you. These, you just need to know. So 
as well as the amino. These groups are alcohols. We know alcohol as like a beverage, right, or as a chemical. That's just ethanol. That structure we drew, ethanol, that's what we mean when colloquially we say alcohol. It's actually a much more expressive, is not the right word, but a much more varied and functional word. OH. R, OH, is what you see in this table. So I'll draw that one up here. And alcohol is given in this table as R, OH. So the alcohol part is this, is the bond to an O, single bond to an O, and then an H there. Uh, I always challenge people to try and come up with mnemonics, to try and come up with ways to memorize these. We'll go through a few of them in class, but what some people say is that alcohol has OH in the name. Oh, good, well played, well played. You beat me to it. You guys are you're sharp, you're hired. As I've said a few times, typically, stu actual studies have shown the dumber it is, the more likely you are to remember it. So if that, if you go look at that and you go, oh, and then you think, man, that's an unfunny joke, it's likely to stick in your head better. So try and my suggestion is to try and find those for as many of these as possible. It makes it much easier than just brute force memorization. And it's kind of fun. Um, if you've seen in the chem office, we have um, index cards taped up on the wall. With some of them are ours, some of them are student contributions to silly chemistry jokes, but many of them are actually memory aids. So see what you can come up with. The alcohol is the OH. What is the R? R is not on the periodic table. R is essentially any chemical. Um, generally speaking, it's a carbon, and then it doesn't have to be just one carbon. It could be a really big molecule. It could be a protein. Six carbons, it could be two carbons, it could be essentially anything that's carbon based. R is a placeholder. That means what I'm talking about right now is alcohol, the rest of the molecule could be any number of different things. What I'm telling you about is just this function. And that's true for all of these. Here I'll redraw this. This is R. Let's redraw that. Let's do ether. What is R? It's the it starts with the carbon, and then after that, it can be any other thing. So if you see an O with a carbon on ether side, <laughs> people are like flipping the table and walking. I quit. Come on, man! I came up with that one. The carbon on either side. Anyway, um, now you're going to remember it, right? Carbon on either side. What might this look like? The most common one. Yeah, people are like, oh, now you The most common one is diethyl ether. We'll go through some of the naming conventions later. There's an O, and it's one to a carbon on either side. Why don't we do this? What is the chemical formula? Do that like CHO business for this molecule, Astron, the one on the right. I'm going to do O first. There's one. But how many carbons are there? Okay, a couple of people said four, a couple of people said two. The fours, how'd you get four? Yeah, a point is a carbon, and then an intersection is a carbon. But the line ends at an O, so that's just an O. So there's two carbons on either side of that. C is four. For the H, I do the same routine I did before. I go through and I make sure all of the carbons have four bonds. H, 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 and then the same on the other side. Ten total, perfect. C four H ten O. Very good. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna let you let you guys find file because that's one of the ones in the flashcards. But let's do amide because that's the one that's not in the book that makes me 
confused about why it's not in the book. So your question was, what style? That's one I'm going to have you look up the flash cards. Uh, Emmet is this, R, which means carbon. Then carbon, double bond O, and then an nitrogen. And here's the trick with this, is that you'll typically draw R2, but here R can be carbon or hydrogen. And this is also true for an amine. Well, let me be more careful. These ones. There really is supposed to be a carbon over here. I have to ask the organic people what happens if this is H. I'm not sure it's still man, I haven't checked that out. So. But if you have carbon and then C double bond O, N, you could have two H's and it would be an amine. You could have an H and a carbon and that would be an amine. You could have two carbons and that would be an amine. All of that is okay. Uh, this is a good point to point out that I say amine. I don't know where I was taught to say it that way. You will find some people who will say, oh my, that's okay. Essentially, any way you can pronounce these, someone else has already said it that way, and it's perfectly accepted in your English. So do not worry about pronouncing these incorrectly, there's no such thing. Whatever you can think of, I assure you someone else with a PhD has said it that way. So don't worry, just say it. You want a flashcard for each of these functional groups because I need you to remember them because that is something you need. If you come up with good ways to remember these that are less or frankly more corny than the carbon on ether side, tell me because I'll spread them around. We'll make a, like a doc for people to put in their best shots to help other people remember. That's good. Or is more. Okay, here are some notes. We already talked about R. R is a placeholder for what's called an alkane. That is a carbon. We'll go through more about what an alkane means in a little bit. Um, the fact, the phrase, though it may be functionalized, means it doesn't have to be just carbon. It could be carbon and then a different functional group. It could be carbon, carbon, carbon. It could be any number of things. The placeholder AR. Is a placeholder for an aromatic group. And this is like that benzene we drew earlier. There's more, there's plenty more aromatics, but. The classic example is benzene. Functional groups you need to know that are not in the book, at least in this section, are thiol, amide, or amide, or amide, it's all good, or amid, I've heard, that. I've heard basically everything, except amide, that's the only thing I haven't heard, but I'm sure, <laughs> but I'm sure there are parts of the world that would say it that way, so that's all good too. Chloride. Well, what's what's chloride and sodium chloride? What's it look like there? Cl, but with what charge? And minus. Chloride in this sense is a chlor is a is a Cl bonded to a carbon. It's partially negative. It is an electronegative element. It's more electronegative than carbon, but it's still good enough of a match. And I mean, actually, you can see that. So electronegativity tends to go up and to the right towards chlorine. Let's look at carbon and, and Cl. I mean, they're not next to each other, but they're over there. They're in the same block. Whereas sodium, that dude's all the way on the other side. 
very different electric nicotine. So carbon and chlorine, they're willing to work together. They're willing to make a bond. Sodium, I have it. Stay on. All right, we already looked one up. Well, we didn't look it up. I said what it was, but that's close enough. Here's some sample expectations. Draw a molecule that contains a carboxylic acid group. And here I say, using lines for two electron and covalent bonds. All that means is don't bother with all the dots of the Lewis structure. Do the line form that we've been doing. Carboxylic acid is one that we didn't go through. It looks like this. Draw a molecule, any molecule you'd like. That means have that structure, except that instead of R, pick a number of carbons and make it like have all the right number of hydrogens. What should I put for R? How many carbons? Four, three, one. Ugh. Okay. How many carbons is R in the drawing I have made? One. This is a correct answer to this question. Someone else said three. Uh, I'm going to do this wrong. There, now my R, which starts here, is one, two, three carbons. That is also a correct answer to this question. You could put any number of carbons. So the molecule has four, but the part that's R starts like here. One, two, three. So there are four carbons in this molecule. Exactly, it's a well spotted. There are four carbons there because the, the bottom of the CO counts. Uh, the phrasing I was using, which perhaps is confusing, uh, is what, like, what's R? So R itself being three carbons, you get the molecule to right. But you're right, the molecule has four carbons. So we don't need to do all of that, because you guys all have everything. I'm just making it worse by doing it now. So you guys, you got it. You got it. Circle and identify the functional group or groups in this molecule. Well, we have actually both of these functional groups I have made bad jokes for in this lecture. What do you see? We see ether, okay, and that is which part? Yeah, the right one. And then a lot of OHs, which is an alcohol. Good. Anyone know what that molecule is right Sugar. 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 The Simpsons, the, the island where they mine the sugar is called the Isle of Side Blue Coast. Yeah. Okay. This is this is what this is what you will do on an exam. This is the level of like where you really need to know about the functional groups. You don't need to know how they react yet. Yeah, you go to organic. You don't need to know which amino acids have which or have to be memorized that. You need to look at a molecule and tell me if that's an ether and there are one, two, three, four, five oh, That's what we're doing. Or a problem. Yeah. Ah, so when you circle it, what like tell them more about the circling. What should I circle? I would say, as long as it's clear that you know where the functional group is, you can circle. So you could have, for example, just circle the OH as I did, or you could circle the OH on the carbon. Either of those, I think, is fine. Here's where you need to be careful, though.
Circle and identify any functional groups in this molecule. What do you do? So, what you need to do, I would suggest when you get this, start with the C double bond O functional groups. So when you have the flashcards, you'll be able to go through them or you'll have the table, but this molecule has a C double bond O, so before you do anything else, if it's a big molecule that has four different things, do those first, because this is only one functional group. The C double bond O with an OH next to it is its own functional group, and therefore you can't split it up into pieces. You have to be that whole one. So this is the nuance I would say about circling them. I would say I know that R, oh yeah, yeah. R, O and OH is a carboxylic acid. So I would circle that whole functional group and say it's a carboxylic acid rather than the pieces. And the, the good follow-up question would be, well, why? And the answer is this behaves differently because the molecule will do different chemistry than one that is just an alcohol. So if you broke it up and said that's an alcohol and that's a ketone, which is what you'll look up as, that would be incorrect. That's right. And the reason is they behave differently. This would be much more acidic, for example, and a much lower pKa than the alcohol. The pKa, this is acetic acid, the pKa is 4.76. Ethanol has a pKa, I forget, I want to say 15, maybe 20, much higher, much more aggressive. But why do you not circle the carbon that? So why do you not circle the carbon? You could, that would be fine. Um, the point I want to make is if you have a functional group, don't split it into pieces. Keep it as a functional group. Good question. Just diving into nuance. Should you take organic chemistry or should you allow me to coerce you into taking organic chemistry even if you don't need it? Working on people. You will do what's called drawing reaction mechanisms. Uh, colloquially, this is called pushing arrows. And on um, one of the lab worksheets, there's some practice for this. Uh, arrows from here to there to explain changes in molecules. Arrows represent what electrons do. Drawing a reaction mechanism, drawing what happens to molecules, what happens when molecules react is really looking at what are the electrons doing. The atoms matter, for sure, but the electrons are where you draw the action. These arrows need to originate at electrons. That is, it has to be a bond or a lone pair. And the arrow needs to point to either to a nucleus or to a bond to become a bond. I counted three things. There might be more, but I counted three things that electrons can do. Electrons can make a bond, because bonds are made of two electrons. Electrons can steal a proton, in which case it's acting as, what's the use protons? Electrons do, but what are they acting at? We need a word for that. Something, a chemical that takes protons. It's a base, that's right. So yeah, it's the electrons that are doing it, but it's acting as a base. They could also form a lone pair, because both bonds and lone pairs are made of I'll write this out with some more space, but let's do this reaction. Two waters get together to make H3O plus and OH minus. This is the pKW reaction. I'll draw out two actual waters. I can do it in color. Now someone, I think it was a left, pointed out earlier that oxygen does not have an octet as drawn, right? It's making two bonds, that's four. That's not an octet. What's missing? Lone pairs. Nice.
And in this case, in, once you get to organic, eventually they stop giving you the products. They, they say, here, tell me what happens. And I go, eh, that's why I'm an inorganic chemist. So I've drawn two waters. I kept them color coded. And actually, let's do this. Give you a little hint. Visual clue. So we'll go through what the answer would actually look like. And this I will put, this I may put as an extra credit, but this won't be. Very good thing to practice with this practice of it, but it's a little bit outside the scope of what I want to do, so we'll do that. What's different? What has a bond that didn't use it? What has a lone pair that didn't use it? That's the sort of differences you're looking for. So the H3O has a new proton that it didn't have before, and it used to have two lone pairs, now it only has one lone pair. And if they take the red, water as drawn. Now it's a hydroxyl color that needs a minus charge. Oopsie. That used to, come on. That used to have two H's, now it only has one. Alright, lost one. And what it has instead is basically three lone pairs instead of two. That's why it's negative. Okay. What I need to do is do what's above. I need to Draw arrows that originate at electrons, that so originates either at a lone pair or at a bond, and it goes to either make a bond or steal a nucleus or form a lone pair. I propose that one of these lone pairs attacks a proton. And that arrow, as drawn, accounts for this new bond. Because it was a lone pair, now it's a bond, still two electrons. But I need to do one more thing, because in the products, so far, these two molecules would be bonded together. They would be stuck. But in the products, they're not. I need to get, well, I need to break a bond that isn't there. Like this H, this red one, needs to be on the black water, not on the red water. So this bond isn't there anymore in the products. Where did it go? Now you got it. What's your answer? <laughs> this bond turns into one of the lone pairs. So two electrons stay, but they stay as a lone pair. Yeah? So why do you work on that side, not that side? So, why do you, uh, so the question is, why do you work on the reactants, not on the products? The, I guess the only real answer is by convention. This is historically how it's done. So you treat the reactants and you say, how do I turn them into Turn them into products. We should draw it, like offline, we should draw it, because I want to see what you think of it. I don't know if it is. Okay. You'll get some practice in this in the lab worksheet. If you're not in the lab, you can dig, uh, get those from either on the lecture page. Um, but again, this won't be on the exam proper. This will show up in the extra credit. Something that will show up on the exam, because you just got to know it is naming alkanes. What I like about these is that a lot of the prefixes work with um, other language elements you may know. How many sides do a hexagon? Six. Nice. Six, six carbons will have the prefix hex. We'll start phrase things. Um, but, yeah. butane is a molecule I've heard of, right? I have a butane letter. I know it sounds like a word, but I used to have a butane letter. So, I mean, in all the languages that I speak poorly, 
even in English, mu does not keep me that that's four, but at least it's a molecule I've heard of. Same with methane. I've heard about methane. It doesn't tell me that's one carbon, but at least I have some familiarity. You need to remember these, and so we make flashcards. If you have a better way to remember them, some of them you can remember, deck is 10, like a decade is 10 years. So some of them you can do. Some of the others you just have to flat out memorize them. If you have good strategies, please do share them. But most people do it by brute force. Here are the conventions for naming organic molecules. Each name will consist of three parts. You have a prefix, which is the position the number and the type of what's called a branch. And by branch, I mean a junction. So here's a branch point on the right, carbon splits. You then have the parent of the name. And that's actually what we just did. So it's like hexane tells me the parent chain, the longest chain is six carbons. And then you have the suffix. Every example I've used so far is ain. I said hexane. I said methane. That's the ain part. The ain means that it's all single bonds. Ean means there's a double bond. Ein means triple bond. What is the longest chain that you can find in the molecule I've drawn on the upper right? So try all the different branching routes. What's the longest chain? Four. Four. If I start from the left, I go one, two, three, and then I go up, four. And if I choose differently, if I choose to turn down at that juncture, one, two, three, four, I still get four. Okay, so either way, the longest chain is four. Um, does anyone have the prefix list handy? Remember which one was four? Yeah, but, or but. Any double or triple bonds in that molecule? Nope. So that's butane. But it's not just a four carbon chain. There is one branch point, so I have to tell people about that. The, the strategy now is to number the longest chain. And here you have a choice. Do you number starting from the left, or do you number starting from the right? The convention says whatever the first branch point is, I want that to be the lowest number possible. So I'll start from the right. Because if, that, if I do that, the branch happens at carbon 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. And again, I do that because now the branch, the, the fork in the road, happens at carbon 2. Whereas if I started from the right, start, excuse me, started from the left, that would be at carbon 3. You choose the one that makes it lower by convention. At carbon 2, what is the length of the carbon chain coming off of the main chain? How many carbons point down? Just one. So where does the prefix say for one? Meth. Methyl, with a YL at the end, is the, the convention for saying, okay, meth tells me how many carbons, it's just one. And the ill, the YL, tells me it's connected to the main chain. <coughs> but where is it? It's at carbon two, so you don't need the dash to it. 
to methyl butane. That's the process. Acid chemistry has perhaps the best practice you'll get for this. Quite a few molecules. I think it's because that's where it is. That's right. There is it's some different one. It's more than one. So the prefixes that are going to be ill? For the prefixes that are a branch coming off of the main chain, it's always ill. That's right. If there were two carbons coming off the main chain, it would be ethyl, propyl, butyl. Yeah. Again. When there's more than one branch, we'll get there. Great question. That's a good video. What happens when there's more than one branch? Well, we gotta do more. Here's the list. We did this for the last one. Find the longest continuous carbon chain. Yeah. So the question was if you have a three methyl butane, does it behave differently than a two methyl butane? Um, in this case, there's no such thing as a 3-methylbutane, because if you drew that, then you could just rename it the 2. But in general, if you have something that has a different branch point, yes, they do behave differently. Um, you ever see coconut oil? It's basically a solid. It's kind of a jelly wax at room temperature, versus olive oil is not, right? Those are pretty much due to different substitution patterns in otherwise very similar molecules. And so what you're seeing there is a difference. It's not exactly the freezing point, but it's basically like that. It's a condensation of sorts. So yes, the typical property people point to are things like boiling point, freezing point. But yes, they can be more reactive or less reactive. They can burn hotter. They can do all different things based on the position. Absolutely. Yep. So this is the process. Editorial I would give to this process is that it was not designed to be user friendly, it was not designed to be easy, it was not designed to be not annoying, it was designed to be unambiguous. This whole system was set up so that you can name a name and everyone in the world who knows the system will draw the exact same molecule and vice versa. So it takes some practice because it's set up in a way that's structured but later, but it is intended to be unambiguous. That's the point of it. We numbered the chain from the end closest to a branch. So we did that. We decided for each end of that molecule, I should start numbering. If you find two branch points that are equal, go to the next one. Let's see where the next branch is. You name these branches as what's called an alkyl group. And that's what Molly was asking. Is the YL is the like end of meth, eth, pro, propyl, butyl, whatever they are. That's the end for all of these branches that are coming up. You then list the branches alphabetically. I find this part to be a little silly, but it is what it is. You list the branches. Butyl comes before propyl. Why? Because it's alphabetical. It is what it is. It was decided, so it is what it's done. Um, we do very little on this type of prefix, N, sec, and T, or tert. Um, if you're curious about that, I'm happy to talk about it. We're not going to do it in exams and stuff, so we're not going to do it. Um, I made a, several conscious choices to draw a box around the parts of organic chemistry we're going to do, because we're doing this in like what, three lectures, in one master in chemistry and one lab. You just you can't do it all. Right? So I'm trying to, the, the choices I made are to try and set you up for it. If you go to organic, you're ready to go and get the ground running. No, 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 no. Right? In an undergraduate, it's a two semester course. Then, if you want, you can do five years of graduate study on it. Like, it goes for an So, we just can't do it all. So, we draw a box. Those are not in the box. If you had someone, someone asks, what happens if you have more than one group, more than one branch? You use prefixes like di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa to tell me how many. If you have two methyl groups, it's dimethyl. So we'll do examples so you can see where all of these are. The branches count in alphabetizing, but prefixes to the branches do not. Butyl comes before propyl. It doesn't matter if it's dibutyl or tetrabutyl or whatever. The branch is the branch.
Let's name this hydrocarbon. I'm going to redraw this because I don't know why I put that in. That's an annoying structure. Double or triple bonds in that molecule? Nah, so it's ane, pentane. Okay. Now I start to collect all the branches. First, I have to know where to number them. If I start at the right or the left, which one gives me the lowest branching points? Yeah, start at the left. Good. You guys are on this. One, two, three, four. Oops, three, four. Let's go down. Five. What branches do I have coming off the five carbon chain I elected to number that way? I got a one carbon chain at two, and then I have a two carbon chain at three. So I have a two methyl, because that's a one carbon chain. And then off of carbon off of carbon three, I have a two carbon chain, which is an ethyl. Alphabetizing. Well, ethyl. Ethyl comes first. So ethyl comes first. Three ethyl. Two methyl. Pentane. It's like it was two different people writing that. I gotta be honest, I find it infuriating that it's alphabetical, not numerical. Why did they do that? I don't know. But it's what's done, so yeah. Now, mastering chemistry, as you will imagine, wants you to put the dashes in the right place. On uh, exams and stuff, no, I'm, if you do that and you forget where the dashes go, I'll still be very happy. Don't worry about it. So mastering chemistry, I think it gives you the clues. It doesn't take a tap away, I think it gives you that routine. But try and get it right, because it will look a little more professional organic. But I'm very happy if you got three ethyl, two methyl pentane. Please draw me a structure for two methyl three chloroheptane. Except that wrong, so chloro should come first. Where would you start? Now, I would draw the long chain first. At this seven, so I would draw seven carbon chains. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a perfect example. As soon as you draw the chain, stop what you're doing and count the carbons to make sure you have the number you want. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Happy. Off of carbon three. Well, where should I number this? I don't know. Let's pick one. It doesn't matter yet. Start from the left. One, two, three, blah, blah, blah. We didn't do chloro. Can you guess what chloro is? 
Yeah, see ya. Okay. That's three. What do I put off carbon two? Methyl, which is one carbon, so I put a line. Done. Question. Questions and thoughts? What did we do? What else did we do? Naming. We did chemical formula versus drawing. We did drawing. Do I have to draw H's? Do I draw other things? We, what else did we do? Good mechanisms. Now, you might be packing up yourself and talking, and that's okay, that's fine. But this I will point out again is, that is how I make the exams. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that you should immediately be able to say, oh, these are five things we need, no problem. It takes practice, and it might take coming and talking to me and saying, is that its own category, or is that part of the thing? That's fine. But this is where you want to be as you head into the exam. I mean, today. You want to be able to go through these and categorize them and say, how many, where can I find more practice for that? The pre so the question was, you have to memorize the prefixes and the names. Yeah, the naming stuff, you got to memorize. Yep. 